Hello and welcome to another Ancient Warfare podcast. Um, today, I've been told it's um, Selassia Day or Selassia episode. It's episode 222. Uh, but we're not going to discuss Selassia, even though that's one of the last times it, what is it the Spartan phalanx gets his butt kicked. We are going to talk pointy spears, long sticks, very long sticks, the introduction of very long sticks. We are going to talk about the rise of Macedon. Um, uh, in the 4th century BC, which should be easily enough to keep us going. And of course, if you want to read more about this topic, check out Ancient Warfare issue 15.6, which deals with it. Um, I'm pretty sure that we don't discuss the first question on my list, which is, was Philip a military genius implementing his own ideas, or did he surround himself with smart people? Who wants to pick that one up? Well, I think... Uh, I think absolutely Philip is a military genius, and I think the uh, tendency of scholars to credit Parmenion especially with the tactics that Philip uses in his early battles is why Parmenion? Parmenion doesn't do anything of note later on under Alexander, and in fact, you know, is is unsuccessful in uh, Asia Minor when he goes ahead of Alexander. So why give him credit for successful tactics earlier? Um, so Philip seems to develop a system. Uh, whereby, according to Diodorus and Plutarch, once he's unexpectedly becomes king um, in uh, 359, he suddenly implements a change in uh, the organization of the Macedonian infantry. We're told that he holds meetings and introduces drill, uh, which is very vague, um, but that seems to be the moment where he has developed his thinking on uh, what he would do if he was put in charge. And remarkably, both of his older brothers get killed and he is put in charge. And of course, he's been a hostage in Illyria and he's been a hostage in Thebes uh, at various points in time in Macedon's changing uh, sort of fortunes in the, in the 370s and 360s. So the fascinating thing about that is that what happens in the Macedonian phalanx and the use of combined arms in Greek warfare and Macedonian warfare, especially the use of light troops and cavalry and combining them with, with heavy infantry, seem to be have developed from those situations as a hostage. Um, and he then puts them into implementation perfectly. Uh, and the, the culminating battle of all that is the Battle of Chironia, which we'll get to, and 338. But in his previous battles, he's shown an awareness of how battlefields work. Uh, and the tools that he creates um, in terms of the Macedonian phalanx really relatively unchanged are what Alexander uses to conquer the Persian Empire. So even though Alexander implements them, they are built by Philip, I think. And so I believe he is a military genius, and he does absorb the lessons of Greek warfare leading up to his reforms in the 350s uh, and creates a, a, a war machine which is pretty much unrivaled until the Roman Legion. Going back to Parmenian, I think the, my take on it is more that it's not necessary that we should take it that Parmenian is, you know, the, the, the genius who um, actually is the, you know, behind Philip and gives the, the impetus to the changes that are brought around. I think it's more that Parmenian is your example, as is um, Antipater, that of that uh, generation that is spanning um, reigns. And you have the same sort of thing when you get to Alexander, that Alexander does not simply move in with all of the guys who, by the end of his reign, are considered to be his key heteroi, his key companions, um, the, the likes of Perdiccas and whatnot. He takes control with a fairly good slice of his father's generals and his father's advisors and i think parmenian and and, and Tap, uh, sorry antipater they are the hangover for likewise for philip of the previous reign of his brother, uh, brother perdiccas and possibly even going back for perdiccas some of those generals that are you know there to advise philip are even hanging on from his uh, philip's father amentus who was Okay, he was run out of his kingdom twice, but at the same time, he does seem to bring in some significant changes that make Macedon into something to be you know, wrestled with in the Balkans. So I think it is that there's that 
not that Philip's not a genius, but I do think that he's influenced quite a lot by something that's been started either by his brothers or by his father, and it is an evolving situation, not something that, like Diodorus um, says, of course, it, he brings in these changes quickly. That sort of is, seems a bit suspect to me. So th- this is, I'm really glad you brought that up, Mark, because it's this is the one thing that scholars use to sort of argue against Philip's genius, right? Is that he's an importer and an imitator, right? That his, not just his um, tenure as a hostage in Thebes, but also his exposure potentially to the Ephicratean reforms uh, that are in that sphere at the same time. And exactly what you're saying, that he's trading on the work of Amintas and, and, and uh, progenitors. But I don't know that that argues against genius, right? The ability to overcome conservatism, right? The ability, especially when it's ingrained culturally, and where is it ingrained the most? It's ingrained in aristocracy and it's ingrained in military circles. And to look at that and say, I know we've always done it this way. We have a joke in the fire service that the only thing firefighters hate um, more than the way things are is change. Um, you know, for, uh, I'll give you a, 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 an example. Uh, we wear very broad brimmed helmets in the United States on the East Coast, and firefighting is a lot of crawling through confined spaces. In Europe, as you know, your helmets are tight fitting. Um, and I've been arguing for years that that makes more sense. If you're crawling between wall studs with wires all around you, you want a small, tight-fitting helmet. I don't, I don't think there's really a, a practical argument to be made against it. And the forces of conservatism in American firefighting makes it impossible to make these kinds of reforms. And, and so that, that decision to import, right, that decision to look at, um, you know, I know we've always done it this way, but we're going to do it differently, argues for genius, even if it isn't him... Um, generating those ideas uh, on his own. Um, so I actually think that, that you're, you're, you're agreeing uh, with Murray uh, by, by taking that. <laughs> well, I think the funny thing, the best example of that is Alexander. Alexander doesn't innovate. He inherits, whether from his father or his uncles and his grandfather, and he then puts it into practice. And, and that same thing with Parmenion is that the generation after Alexander who want to be like Alexander, none of them reach his level. Um, and so the, you've got Philip and Alexander who seem to both be military geniuses in their own ways and the people who are their professional surrounds who are their generals and their commanders may be the professional backbone of the army, but put them in the same position of leadership and they aren't going to achieve the same level. of. Philip does some losing too early on, right? Uh, before Crocus. There's only one, there's only one general, uh, on a Marcus who defeats him. Yes. Before Crocus Field. You know, uh, he defeats him twice. And you're like, where's the detail on that? No, sorry, no detail. Well, we have no, we have one detail. We have one detail that some kind of artillery, and and help me out here, Murray. Is it is it Pausanias or Diodorus is telling the story? But the, all I know is that there's some artillery use, and it doesn't. And I, and I was I was doing the translation. I couldn't figure out if it's an onager, like what the artillery was. But I know that. It well, was the, like, I think the I think it's heavy stones is what we're told, and we're like, well, the only way to get heavy stones onto a battlefield is artillery. Is an onager, right? Yeah. And I think it's it. Well, you've got yeah. I think it's Diodorus Pausanias and Polyanus has an anecdote. And then we get that great quote: "We we do not run; we back up as rams do to strike harder next time." To strike harder next time round. And the funny. Th- the funny thing about that battle is, again, I think that is uh, Philip imitating because the story is that Onomarchus retreats up a hill and from the hill is where he's able to defeat the, the Macedonians. And yet, and when you look at the Battle of Chironia, uh it's a very complicated battle to try and sort the sources out. But uh, that's one version of, is that Philip's army retreats from the Athenians backwards up a hill at Chironia. And funnily enough, there's only one hill that they could have done it from and it's far away from where most people put the battlefield. Um, and then he turns around and charges down the hill again. And you're like, well, if he's just copying what happened to him. Um, you know, and so it's a very complicated thing. But I think that idea of, you know, the, the highest compliment is, is imitation uh, is something that sort of Philip lives by. He sees something that works and he copies it. I got to go find them, but I do want the listeners to see them. There's a couple of secondary sources that are excellent for this. And I want to grab him, so keep talking. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's a funny thing that what is what what is genius? I mean, obviously you could talk for well a lifetime on what is genius, but I think the fact that Philip and Alexander are able to Im- implement what they've got in a way that other others can't 
uh, is amazing. The other thing I really like about Philip is the the record of pithy statements within the battle formation uh, at the right time. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sources are full of them. And the other thing that's most interesting is Philip seems to be an infantry general. He's always with his infantry on the right. That seems to strike against the, the norm for everything to do with Macedon from the earliest point of Macedonian history. It's all cavalry. It's all the, the earliest image of Macedon on a coin is, is the cavalry. Which also strikes that he is an innovator, that doing that and being with the infantry and reforming the infantry is his thing. And it's also interesting because, of course, after Leuctra, the idea that the, you know, the Thebans on the left, not the right, is somehow you know, a, a game changer. The Spartans never change. They're always on the right. Um, you know, and, and the king is always stationed on the right. And so with Macedon and with Philip, he stations himself on the right. When Alexander takes over, having been on the left flank in Chironia, he switches to the right flank, but in charge of the cavalry on the right flank of the Hypaspists and the Phalanx. So he's on the right, but he's he's with the cavalry, reverting to standard, you know, kingly Macedonian practice of, of being with his his companions. And just just so, because I promised the readers, um, they're both they're very very dated, but I've never found better the Sacred War uh, we're, that we've been discussing. This defeat by Anamarchus is the third Sacred War, and it really speaks to Philip's. Um, a genius or lack thereof, depending on which side you stand. So the first is John Buckler, Philip II in the Sacred War. This is 1989. And then the second is Cockwell, George Cockwell, Philip of Macedon. Uh, this isn't a library book. I'm a bad person for owning it. But it's, um, it is, uh, and it's 1978. They're both dated, but it's, it's hard to find good writing about the Sacred War. So I just want listeners to to know so about the these fine two. on that is 44 uh, yes, years I'm, now. I'm going to have to sell my house to, to pay the fine off. Well, as, as, as you said, Murray, the genius comes in in different forms. It's recognizing maybe what needs to be done or that not something needs to be done and then figuring out what it is and, and pushing that through. That in itself is requires an enormous global leadership for one. And, and it, clearly that wasn't lacking in Philip. Do we know anything about the people he's... I mean, this, the question, if we want to come back to it, it really asks, did he surround himself with smart people? Or is this is this what you what we're really saying is he learned from what he needed from the hard lessons that he got early in his life? Uh, and in that respect, he just picked up what what was necessary and copied it. Look, I, I will say this. I will say this as a serving as served as a military officer, the best leaders. And look, remember, the higher you go in military command, the less tactical control you have over the functions of your unit. Um, and I can at least speak to myself. There's one thing I'm proudest of as a, as a Coast Guard officer, and that was that my non-commissioned officers ran my unit. I had you know, men with 20 and 30 year experience, you know, all men in my case, um, uh, and, and they had forgotten more than I would ever know. And my job was to give them bullets and gas and to keep the higher brass off their backs and let them do their jobs. And I think a lot of people looking at that style of command might think that I lacked initiative or that I didn't want to assert my own personality, but that made me a good officer and it made my unit run effectively. So I would argue that, that the ability to defer to, it's sort of like the great man theory of history, the, the ability to defer to your senior staffers is actually a mark of genius and an officer as counterintuitive mm. as that might seem. Yeah, knowing, knowing that you can rely on them, I think. And I think, again, coming back to the idea that the the commanders of the individual tax ace of the, of the phalanx, you know, the six of them, and there's remarkable continuity of those six commanders across uh, Philip's and Alexander's battles when we know. Uh, you know, it's like, hang on, that's the same person commanding that tax ace of the phalanx for the entirety of that decade uh, so that, that uh, you know, they knew what they were doing. And I, I said, is that a smart person or is that someone who knows how to do their job? As you said, it's smart to know who to trust. And it's interesting because some of them, of course, are all about, I want to be promoted into the Hitairoi. I want to be a companion. But I think some of them are better, would have been better to stay where they were, not seek that promotion because they were a better infantry commander than they ended up being as a cavalry commander. I think there's also there's evidence, not you know, uh, as always, there's not as much evidence as we'd like, um, but I think there is some evidence for independent commands being given out, um, not just by Philip, but also by 
his brother Perdiccas, because it, there's the suggestion Philip himself might have been the recipient of a an individual command. I think it's around somewhere around Amphipolis, I believe, um, at some point. And then uh, subsequently, when he becomes uh, the monarch, you've got an Antipater. I think becomes something equivalent to the regional commander of that area again. So it's it's not just trusting, but also it's actually having the, the wherewithal to actually divide up your your command and actually govern in a in a logical manner. Yeah, I think you know it's funny as we have this conversation. The one thing I think we should have almost started with is what makes a military genius. Of course, that would be a whole podcast episode in its own. What do we mean by when we say someone's a military genius, right? Because the, you know, I think a lot of the assumptions of what makes a military genius are often driven by, um, you know, uh, I'm not saying this to put anyone down, but like a distance from the actual requirement, you know, requirements of military command, you know? So, I mean, we, we sort of went over it. A second question here, actually. Um, who's the greater innovator, Philip or Alexander? Well, I would I would say that if we were going to agree that Philip took an army that was not professional, that is that it was basically like a militia, but then improved it drastically by giving it the Sarissa and then uh, turning it in, the, making use of the aggressiveness of the troops that he had on hand. Uh, then it would seem that he has to be the greater innovator because Alexander took the phalanx and used it in his campaigns, but he did not. He, he did not overhaul uh, the weaponry that they wielded. I, I would say there just on that alone. Uh, let, let's also let, let's also let's also say one other thing. Alexander also then did make many changes much later on in his career uh, and and did change the Macedonian army but I, I would say that at least when you consider you know, who had who had the greatest influence on the fighting nature of the Macedonian army uh, at least initially you have to say it would be Philip I would say that there's circumstances to take into consideration here because if you're saying Philip and this is taking a very long long term view, Philip is in a situation where Macedon is throughout from the 5th century throughout until his reign in a state of flux. You've got, you know, Macedon in terms of its positioning is at a key point where forces, if they're talking about Persian army moving into Europe, be it just for a, you know, uh, Darius's campaign in, across into Europe for the first time or the Xerxes invasion, Either way, Macedon is a key lynch point, and it plays a very interesting part under Alexander the First in terms of balancing who he's going to actually back and who he's actually going to be diplomatic towards. But at the same time, because of what uh, the Persian army does as it moves across, it destabilizes the entire area. There's a huge amount of the uh, Pannonian tribe that are actually in true Persian style. They are moved lock, stock and barrel across into Persian territory because it is deemed that these are the troublemakers that we're going to move into, you know, somewhere that we can manage them better, etc. which again does Macedon actually huge giant favours in terms of the political balance of the circumstances. And that keeps going into, as you move into the dominance of Athens, Sparta, Peloponnesian War, etc. We've mentioned already the, the sacred wars as well. It's a, a very fluid environment but alexander on the other hand he's not necessarily you know in a circumstance throughout his career where it is something that is up for grabs it is up for you know manipulating to his advantage instead he's going into as he moves east i'm sort of thinking in terms of his campaigns he's moving into more stable areas in terms of that you know he's got to adapt more so i think that puts more of a demand on him than necessarily Philip's going to face. It's it's all different, but yeah. He also inherits a dream. You know, Philip's planning to invade Persia. Alexander inherits that. So it's like, here's your map. <laughs> uh, so in a way, the pressure was off him to reform, recover um, the Macedonian state. Uh, Alexander inherits us, you know, the dominant force in Greece. Um, I, I think this also is picking up on a, a, a later question in, in the list, but is it possible to also say that Philip II 
uh, his innovations, and I'm, once again, I'm thinking especially of his his reform of the phalanx, giving them the sarissa. Uh, it, it was an evolution of ideas that were percolating throughout Greece for for decades. That that is the 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 hoplite panoply had been lightening the the uh, shield had been getting smaller, the spear had been getting longer. Uh, the the pikeman with the wielding the sarissa in two hands with a two foot uh, diameter uh, target shield. That just seems to me the logical progression of that. So uh, when I consider where did he learn that, where did he get these ideas, many of these ideas may simply have occurred in several places at once. That is, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a single genius having this, you know, or innovator having this idea, but many people. And Mark, you're exactly right. And you're backed up by Snodgrass. So um, I don't know how other folks feel. I still think that Snodgrass's Arms and Armor of the Greeks is the gold standard, at least for the material record. Um, I understand they're dated. There is a new edition, I think, that dates to the 80s. But Mark, that exact argument, and he does it with material finds in Bulgaria and in Magna Graecia and shows that these are... Um, and, and also, by the way, uh, Anatolia and the, and the uh, west coast of Asia Minor, Caria, um, that these are ideas uh, that are uh, either spreading very rapidly um, with no particular source or evolving simultaneously in different locations. It, it's, it's greatly complicated by the fact that people stop burying warriors with their grave goods, uh, you know, uh, as the classical era dawns. Um, but Snodgrass makes the exact argument that you're making, Mark, and, and backs it up. Um, with the material records. So I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. The, the other thing I wanted to add was that, um, and I want to see if folks agree, is it accurate to say that Alexander was the greater innovator by far, but that his innovations were sociocultural rather than military? And I'm speaking, of course, uh, about his enforced marriages and his um, attempt to cosmopolize, to, to forcibly integrate Persian and Greek um, cultural dynamics, which of course, I really think it's, we can say, disastrously failed, right? You know, all of these Macedonian uh, nobles and officers put their wives aside the, the minute that he was dead. I have always been amazed that that, and, and maybe that there were military aims there, right, to, you know, uh, draft a pool of available military manpower and to establish a military aristocracy in the East upon which he could draw, especially when he moved his capital there. But there is such an interest in in 2022 in in, in race, in ethnicity, in, in integration, in diversity. And here is this ancient king who, who literally like takes on a social, sociocultural experiment, the likes of which I don't think we've ever heard of, right? This, this real effort at integration, at forced integration, you know, in the fourth century BC. And it goes mostly unremarked. And I've always been fascinated why it is that that is not, more people aren't writing about that. I didn't know what folks uh, thought of that. It's kind of a big theme in Oliver Stone's movie, isn't it? Oliver Stone's movie is so bad that I don't think anybody can, I don't think it can be talked about productively. I think I just got goosebumps at the mention of it. I mean, there's not much evidence in terms of, you know, af after the fact of exactly what the details are with many of the wives. I think it's, is it Pucestus that is the one who famously keeps his wife and, you know, adopts more Persian customs than any other of the, of the generals of Alexander. I think Seleucus... Likewise, I think keeps from memory his his Persian wife, for, but they are the the exceptions to the majority rule. And in the uh, you know, majority of uh, in most of it, we don't get much extra information than that. And that that the other wives are discarded and go back to native husbands. I think is mentioned in one of them. But I think I think there's also. I'm gonna I'm gonna be the Philip uh, lover here, uh, Philip 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 Philos, uh, because Philip has done it. Philip has taken multiple wives in order to incorporate Epirus and in order to incorporate Illyria. He's married them, and they remain the allies of Macedon unchallenged throughout Alexander's reign. You know, there he's are only Illyrian copying what his dad did. I mean, he's, he's, his his own mother is um... no, no, absolutely <laughs> multiple wives. Yes, but who he marries. Yes, yeah, same with his mother. His mother, his mother is not Macedonian. No, no, no. But 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 whom Philip marries and when Philip marries them? Yeah, but when Philip marries them is all about, you know. And and we haven't talked about. I think there isn't. Yeah, there's a question on Philip's diplomacy, which is he wins more battles by breaking promises, making promises than than 
almost any other. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about, you know, his relations with Athens promising not to take Amphipolis, taking Amphipolis, you know, um, and yet he still maintains this uh, reputation in Greece of, of being trustworthy, even though you're looking at him from, you know, two and a half thousand years later going, yeah, he's not going to keep that promise. Sure enough. Oh, there you go. Roxanne is, uh, Roxanne is Sogdian. Yeah. Sogdian rock. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that, that whole pattern for Alexander, I think is set up by Philip and Macedonian traditions. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, I mean, that you see that in the issue that Philip is very interested also in, he starts out by having to unite Macedon itself. You can do, do, do the question. My question would be, isn't Alexander trying to do the same thing, but writ large, you know, he has to keep this whole thing together. So how do you do that? You have family relations and. But the question then is who are the, who are the Agaeids? Because this dynasty is, if you go to their traditions, they aren't, they don't identify themselves as Macedonians anyway. They're saying they are foreign rulers. They go back to the, their legendary, you know, origins in Argos and, even then, it's sort of, even if you sort of try to brush it away as all legend and whatnot, there still seems to be this con- con- constant theme that we are other than, and, you know, again, it's Philip going to the uh, to Olympia and saying, I, I, can, uh, I can enter the Olympics because I'm Greek, I'm not like the rest of them and whatnot. It's, so uh, it'd be interesting to sort of, you know, is it is there an attitude of the royal dynasty saying, you know, we're not Macedonian anyway, so we can do international relations independent of, you know, a Macedonian identity? Well, but I mean, but that that's funny because going back to the Sacred War, you know, Philip pretty shamelessly is like, I am rescuing the sanctuary of Apollo from the filers. And doesn't he even, isn't it Crocus Plain Murray that he garlands his there's there's something he does there to specifically designate. They wear a wreath so that they are the yeah the liberators the liberators of the temple and the same Orchomenos who beats him. Uh, I think he crucifies. He does something to him, but the way in which Orchomenos is punished is specific to temple robbers. Yes, and uh, and and the previous commander um, uh, he gets thrown off a rock. Or throws but himself. That's, off, yeah, that's also specific. Which to is also robbers. specific to temple robbers. Yeah, a little uh, confusing. Yeah, although there is a story that um, Orchomenus drowns and he then takes the corpse out of the water and crucifies it, which is kind of grisly. But um, but the but the but the point I'm trying to make here is that is that when it when it suits him, Philip absolutely uh, positions himself. Oh wait a minute! He, so he does that in the Sacred War, but then of course, what is he doing in the invasion of Persia? He is avenging. The Greco-Persian wars, right? He's acting as the the head of the Greeks in this regard. So yeah, they're, yeah, they're certainly happy to take the Greek mantle when it when it suits them. Which very smoothly goes into diplomacy. Uh, Abram's question: How effective were Philip's diplomacy and bribes in weakening the unity of Greece? Extremely effective. Extremely effective. Um, okay. Next think, question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, look, and again, these two books, I, I, I say them again to the readers, they're dated, but they're excellent. And what they will do is they, they really break down his relationship with Jason of Ferrey, um, his relationship with the Thessalian League, his, um, his playing um, uh, against uh, his, him setting himself up uh, with the Amphictyons, a sort of liber, liberator of the um, sacred precinct of Apollo. There really is, I think, quite a bit of evidence, and I'm certainly happy to be proven wrong. Uh, by any of the other panelists, but I think there's just an abundance of evidence that he really understood the, um, at least in Northern Greece, the interplay of Greek politics and exploited them pretty shamelessly. And in fact, he ends the Third Sacred War not by conquering Thermopylae, but by occupying Thermopylae by means of a ruse, kind of a forced march out of Scatusa, which I think gets the Phokians to throw in the towel, and then in turn Athens throws in the towel when the Phokians are no longer available. Um, and and he sort of he, he definitely understands the um, uh, the um, how do I say this the the legendary cultural hold that Thermopylae has on the people of that region that if there are troops in that pass uh, forget it we're not even messing with that even though I think w- when you look at all the many battles of Thermopylae and there are very many someone should write a book about that oh wait I am um, the uh, that really tactically. Tactically, it isn't that big a deal, um, but he, he seems to grasp the hold it has culturally over the people there. 
I'm glad you actually said that because actually the whole thing about him being a master of bribes and whatnot, I think that does him short in terms of actually assessing the situation, assessing that, you know, okay, his brother might have been, you know, dispatched in conflict against the Illyrians, but actually it's his assessment of the situation that leads to a victory over the Illyrians subsequently because he assesses their, you know, whether they are ready or what is the you know, situation in terms of the readiness of their army at that point in time. So I think he's, he's a good strategist in that sense. And, and the other thing is, for me, it's fascinating, you know, because he seemed, when we look at the, you know, the chronology of his events, he's untrustworthy. He makes promises and breaks promises as easily as anything. And yet a succession of Greek states go, he's the man to rescue us. You know, he's invited into Thessaly to be their archon. You know, so again, not he's he's invited to be the head uh, official of the Thessalian League as a rescuer, as a, as a, as a, you know, as a, and you're like, this guy, this, this promise breaking guy. Yeah. him. And so he does that successively, you know, and when you look at Isocrates, Isocrates and Demosthenes have been attacking Philip as the threat to Greece. And then all of a sudden he wins Chironia. It's like, you're the, you're the liberator. <laughs> you're like, sorry, but this is the, this is the, the one guy we have to worry about for most of his career. And now you're saying he's the, he's the guy who's going to inherit this. You've got to go and conquer Persia message, which we've been, you know, Isocrates has been giving it since yeah, the, the it's, creation. It's called redirecting the threat, Murray. Well, yeah, but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, Philip is Philip's ability to position himself as what's needed and to to see what is needed is now, remarkable. I actually, and, and here's a question: Is this a trope, a story trope? Because this is exactly the story of Paris being invited into Italy, um, and of course, there's that great story of I forget the the guy comes into the assembly hall playing the harp with a dancing girl, and he goes, "Oh, I'm I'm so glad you laugh. You're not going to be laughing when Paris gets here." Remember? Uh, and takes over and 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 starts ruling and and there's and there's other stories like that um, and that makes me wonder if that's kind of a, like a, a trope in the sources right that that you invite the you invite the foreigner in at your own peril right so, and and also wait wait the Aetolians invited in uh, Antigonus right or, or not Antigonus yeah that what led us to Selassie was an invite right to intervene so yeah it certainly isn't um, the only uh, situation where those things uh, you know. Excellent. No, it wasn't Antigonus. Antigonus is second no. dose. I'm sorry. I don't think we're disagreeing. <laughs> Very effective. Let's see. Um, so, oh gosh, I think we have to go to back to Phalanx. Is he a copycat? Did he did he copy what he saw in Thebes, or did he take it to the next level? To, 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 um... Next level. I think the fascinating thing for me is we've talked already that, that there is a trend in efficacy and responses. And unfortunately the sources really let us down as to exactly what was the efficacy and uh, innovation in Athens in the three nineties. Is the spear doubled? Is it half doubled? We, you know, the Greek is unclear and no one's really sure. If you have it and double it again, you end up the same length. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. As in, as in, as in you, you, you double it by half rather than double it. So I believe the Greek of Diodorus oh, isn't perfect. quite clear. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, we then have this varying measure of this, the Macedonian Sarissa. Is it 10 cubits? Is it 12? Is it 14? Um, and, you know, various people, modern scholars will argue it's that one. You know, like, I don't think it's kind of the exact number you think it is. And nor can you say this source is reliable because this archaeological find is 12 cubits. Therefore, it's 12 cubits. I think, you know, this is a pre-industrial world. They could absolutely have had a variation in the length of the Sarissa by a cubit. Um, but that trend, that trend has already been occurring. Um, so that's something that he, uh, adopt, you know, and that's before Philip's time. So he, he adopts that so much so that we don't get sources talking about the length of the Sarissa as being anything particularly different. You know, no one talks about the, the length of the Sarissa being shockingly long. Um, the, the depth is interesting because, of course, uh, what you've had in the earlier fourth century, and especially at, at, at Leuctra and Mantinea, is a supposedly deep the Theban formation. I don't agree that it's 50 ranks deep. I think that's Xenophon being uh, misleading um, because he also tells us that the rear ranks of that formation, which he says is 50 ranks deep, are useless and don't want to be there. So you're like, well, they're not actually effectives then, are they? Whereas when you go back through Theban 
uh, history at the Battle of De Delium, we're told they're 25 ranks deep. At the Battle of Nemea, we're told they're deeper than the 16 ranks that the, the Athenians adopt. So uh, it would seem to be about 25 ranks is the Theban model. And so interestingly, what Philip does with the phalanx is that the standard fighting depth of the phalanx is 16 ranks, which is, again, very standard. When you look at the, the Athenians at, at Nemea, they're 16 ranks deep. Uh, in Syracuse, they're 16 ranks deep. So that's not a change really either. Murray, question. Is there evidence? I know that Philip V at Kinokephaly doubles, and there is an, uh, an, an officer. Sorry, I covered, covered my eyes when I'm thinking. There's an officer, there's an officer in the file who is the, the doubler point, right? That's and the, and the Greek title's in it. Is there does that exist in the Alexandrian phalanx? Yes. So, okay. No, so it, well, it seems to. And I mean, the tactica would be me talking for seven hours without taking breath. So, um, very briefly, I think the tactica originate with Philip's phalanx, not the Hellenistic phalanx afterwards. I believe that they all start by saying it's Philip's phalanx. So it's that and Alexander's phalanx that they're re reiterating. We get at the Battle of Issus the, the, when Alexander turns around and advances towards Darius. The, the terrain is so narrow that he doubles the length of the phalanx, doubles the depth in order to fit them. And then as they advance towards the, the Persians, they then spread out to their standard depth. So he doesn't go into battle in double depth, but he does he does advance in double depth. And I think so th those things and and the smaller shield trend, the the Pelte, which again is a Ficratean, all of those innovations have happened before Philip's time. So the point that when Philip adopts them en masse into the phalanx, they are they're not uh so innovative as to to be mentioned. So I think it's the the, the the overall concept of what he does with the phalanx that's that's the the innovation rather than the sarissa being longer isn't particularly innovative the pelte being smaller isn't particularly innovative the depth of 16 ranks isn't particularly innovative um i think it's yeah. how it operates together and when i think about like we have a, we have a theban captivity and we have an illyrian captivity um and a, a lot of what we see here are sort of the ficratean reforms which are athenian i understand that dovetails into the Thebes. But what are the big Theban innovations, right? We have this mass depth that you just described. We have the positioning troops on the left. I don't see any evidence of any of that in the Macedonian army. So in the, well, ooh, seven, 25 hours to get through this stuff. Um, the funny thing is- Murray, let me, let me give you one more because I, I want you to address it all at once. But the other, of course, is the echelon deployment and refusal of the right flank, right? Um, I don't see that in evidence either. So I just wanted to put those- you can comment on that one. Funnily enough, and, and suppose this might this might lead to how Philip is most uh, innovative. He refuses the left flank, and so does Alexander. In all of Alexander's battles, it is the rightmost taxace of the phalanx that advances in company with the hypaspists and then with the companion cavalry. So you've got the left side of the phalanx staying where it's put, and the right moving forward. And really, the um, the accordion ability of the of the Macedonian phalanx to have the taxis advance and then stay in contact with the taxis on its left or its right is is po probably the biggest innovation that you've got that Philip's formation is able to achieve regularly. Uh, and so what you've got also at the Battle of Chironeer, um is Philip's side of the phalanx withdraws in the face of the Athenian advance to the point where the contact between the Athenian phalanx and the Theban phalanx is broken. And that's where Alexander charges. And that's how the Thebans are surrounded and the, the sacred band is white. So, so, so whose idea is that? Is that Philip or is that Alexander? Does Alexander learn there that his cavalry can be so effective? I think that that is what Philip learns at Thebes, that echelon deployment, but he then incorporates it in a different way because those the battle of chironia is not uh is not an advance in echelon it's a withdrawal in echelon it's not the it's not the cavalry um element not coming from more illyria than thebes in terms of in terms of what he learns from bardellus and yes yeah the ca the combined cavalry charge with an infantry support is very much what bardellus shows him um and the uh, article in the issue um about the battle that I, I named it based on Belloc's 19th century German scholarship and got, you know, comments on Facebook that said that 
you've named the battle at the wrong place. I'm like, I, 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 that was the name of the battle. Monastia. Um, the Battle of Monastia is what we, we illustrated. So that, that again, is, is an, an adoption. But what you find in Philip and Alexander, and I can't imagine, you know, Alexander's 18 at the Battle of Chironia. He must have been following instructions. I don't think that he's going to charge the gap uh, on his own without going, his father saying, I'll make the gap, you charge the gap. Because the funny thing is that what happens at the Battle of Granicus, Issus, and Galgamela is Philip's phalanx and his withdrawal to the right creates a gap. What does Alexander do? Charges the gap in all three battles. Um, so it's like that is a tried and true technique uh, that Philip has shown Alexander that works. And Philip, uh, then Alexander then does it again and again and again um, remarkably well. So uh, coming back, uh, which closes nicely, when it comes to innovation and leadership, is can we say Alexander is the great battlefield leader but Philip is the innovator. I think you could say that Philip was also a great battlefield leader, but uh, for the, for the purposes of length of career, I mean, Philip and Philip and Persia would have been a very interesting alternative history. How, how Philip would have done it differently. I mean, he would have had Alexander as his cavalry commander by his side. Uh, it would, would have been a, 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 an amazing uh, campaign. I think. We have to, we have to get Har- Harry Hurdles of on the line to write that. <laughs> if, if I could make one other uh, point about Philip, that is by giving uh, very long, not certain exactly how long the, the pikes were given to the uh, the phalanx, but by giving very long weapons to his soldiers, he reduced the amount of defensive equipment that they would need. And that would have reduced the cost it would have taken to equip any particular soldier and thereby made it possible to enlarge his army at a at a relatively lower cost so there i see that his phalanx was a, a way to get more men I- into the field at a relatively lower cost so so mark i'm going to disagree with you um and i'm going to call on snodgrass again um what and this dovetails actually into a piece i'm writing for the next issue for murray um, so what Snodgrass documents, I think, pretty convincingly is exactly what we described initially. It's from the archaic era through the classical, a lightning of heavy infantry panoply through the, the Greco-Persian era toward the end of the Peloponnesian War. And then as the Sarissa-armed Pesatyro phalanx predominates, that armor comes roaring back. Um, and I think that uh, probably the, the pretty clear reason for that is you can't maneuver with a 21-foot pike at a three foot interval in 16 ranks. Um, you're not getting out of the way, so you better be a better armored for it. Um, and, I, and there is, uh, Snodgrass does make that case of, for the returning of, of, of more complete armor. I don't know that, um, and in fact, that, that financial wherewithal armor, especially when you get state issued equipment, which you really see a rise of in the uh, Alexandrian phalanx. So I, I don't know that the archaeological record supports the argument, but I'm certainly open to have that. Um, we get that. We get. The, we get the. We get the stuff in the sources that the front ranks are better armored because they're going to be. And the interesting thing about all the countermarches of the Macedonian phalanx, that front rank doesn't change. So if if the enemy attacks you from behind, you countermarch to the rear. You don't just turn about so that your rear rank is. So your rear ranker, who is an officer, he's also well armored, but I believe. I'm going to agree with both of you because I'm sitting on a fence. Uh, I think that there are there are men in the phalanx who are probably less armored because they're in the rear ranks. Um, but their idea of promotion is to be promoted forward and to become better equipped as they as they you know loot their enemies and and earn more uh, booty. And so that's what survives, obviously, in the archaeological record is the better armored individuals whose armor survives whereas the i've got a helmet and a spear and a shield nothing else that the, nothing of them is going to survive in the in the record um and so i think that the the, the increase in armor is because of the threat to the ones at the front because the other thing that's amazing about alexander's battles is this phalanx is in battle with persian bowmen for hours and they suffer 30 casualties so i think one of the amazing things about the phalanx that we don't really concentrate on and even you know uh, uh, experimental archaeology can't really is the array of spears in the air behind the front ranks does the best job of disrupting missile fire that you could possibly wish for i talk about roll clinton arguments on this podcast quite often and he argues very strongly against that he does not believe that 
the canopy of, of pikes provides any real significant missile protection for what it's worth. How does a Macedonian phalanx sit in combat with an archery enemy for three hours and suffer 30 casualties? They're either really bad archers. Or- I have some thoughts about this, and it has to do with the, the character of Persian arrows. Um, and there's that wonderful description of um, in the Anabas, Anabasis, Anabasis, forgive me. I only read Greek. I can't, I can't pronounce it no matter what I do. Um, but where Xenophon, of course, talks about the Cretan broadhead and, and, the, Cre- and the Cretans sort of getting that longer arc. Uh, Mark, you probably could correct me on the exact passage. But the point is, is that, and we also have from the archaeological find, we have these Cretan broadheads with a thicker wooden shaft versus reed shaft, smaller bronze, triple pronged uh, or triple flanged arrowheads um, that are just less effective against bronze armor, that are less effective, certainly against the ASCII days. Um, and I do think that, that, that there's a, a connection there as to why they're able to, to withstand. There is certainly the, the reed arrows are originally designed to take on other Asian armies. It's not, not aimed at the Western army as of the Greeks. So therefore it's, yeah, it, how effective it would be um, is very questionable. So I think the film scenes we see where the arrows thunk in like some solid longbow arrow are not quite uh, as accurate as they should be, you know, piercing all layers. Another example is um, Regent Pausanias, not the writer, taking omens and refusing to, to charge a platea, which I've called out as, as cowardice. I know people disagree with me on that until the Tegaeans are like, enough of this, we're going. Um, he sits there for a while. Um, and the Aspides are pl- they're fine. They're enough um, to stop those arrows. So I think there's, some, there's a clue there as well. But I, I, I think that that must be part of it. And, and not just arrows. I mean, javelin, we have javelin armed cavalry also not having an impact on the phalanx so um yeah on that bombshell Bombshell. (laughs) welcome to our podcast bombshell yeah well next year uh, next year we've got to go tackle alexander don't we murray it's going to be some kind of anniversary because it's 223 he died in 323 bc there's a there's a number there somewhere which is lovely and round it's 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 the middle of the (laughs) night i can't calculate that right now so (laughs) thank you all very much for joining us and uh, we'll see you again soon 